We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood on June 4th, 1980. It was written by Devin Goldenberg, based on a story by Devin Goldenberg and Alan Roberts, featuring characters from the novel The Happy Hooker by Xavier Hollander with Yvonne Dunleavy and Robin Moore, directed by Alan Roberts and released by Canon Films. This film is the third installment in the Happy Hooker series, which started with the direct adaptation of Xavier Hollander's novel The Happy Hooker in 1975, starring Lynn Redgrave as Xaviera. The novel was autobiographical. In 1968, Xaviera resigned from her job as a secretary in the Dutch consulate in Manhattan to become a call girl, where she made $1,000 a night, which is the equivalent of $7,400 a night today. I don't know how she did that just overnight making that much. I guess she just had access to the right clients. Oh, I imagine you make connections to the consulate. Yeah. <laughs> you get hit on by enough people from <laughs> enough of them visiting no, dignitaries. Not, 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 the, not, not that we're trying to say anything negative about the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> A year later, she opened her own brothel, the Vertical Whorehouse, and soon became New York City's leading madam. And in 1971, she was arrested for prostitution by the New York police and forced to leave the United States. A year later, in 1972, she released the novel of her story. Before the Happy Hooker film series, Xaviera had been portrayed twice on film, once in a straight pornographic film called The Life and Times of Xaviera Hollander in 1974, and again in a film called The Best Part of a Man in 1975, the same year as the Happy Hooker film franchise. It's about her, though. <laughs> Um, she, 70, she's the best part of a man. <laughs> 75 was a big year for her, though, because that was the best part of a man. She was she is featured in it as a character being played by an actress, but she also released her first Happy Hooker film based on her novel, and her the first documentary about her life came out in 75. So that was just like that year everyone she's really cared about. Super popular. The Happy Hooker, yeah. A sequel to The Happy Hooker called The Happy Hooker Goes to Washington, this time starring Joey Heatherton as Xaviera. Um, and she also appears as herself in two documentaries of her life story. One I mentioned in 75 and another in like 2006 or 2008 very recently. But the Happy Hooker Goes to Washington was after this one, right? No. Oh, that came before this one? That was in 77, yeah. So that was the the second of the three and this is the, the final installment. Got it. Um, each installment of the franchise was released by Canon Films, of which this is our first Canon film. Uh, in 1979, Canon Films was very near destitute, and founders Dennis Friedland and Chris Dewey sold Canon to Israeli cousins Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus for half a million dollars. In the 70s, Golan Globus produced a total of seven films with Canon and moved into the 80s as owners of the company and pushed forward greenlighting bottom of the barrel scripts into production with some amazing results. We have three more coming on our schedule this year, including Schizoid, The Apple, and New Year's Evil. We have New Year's Evil and Christmas Evil? Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing that it took until exactly 1980 for people to realize that pun <laughs> for the use of horror movies. We start the film with a Mercedes limousine driving through Beverly Hills. Uh, Mr. Warkoff is in this limousine, and it pulls into the Warkoff Brothers Studios lot. Uh, the gate man calls into the offices and warns all the employees that Mr. Warkoff has arrived and to get ready. Was it just a coincidence, or were they trying to pretend that it's Warner Brothers? No, I think it was definitely a parody of Warner okay. Brothers. Yeah. Not that Warner Brothers had anything to do with the first Happy Hooker film. It was it was straight canon the whole way. And it's possible that this third installment was actually a, a retelling of her experience trying to get the first film made in the well, same way that Scream 3 yeah. is the story of scream getting made into a movie yeah that's that's almost certainly what this is because it's uh, like she might be making fun of a specific person from when she was trying to get the first movie made i don't know fair enough yeah uh workoff's grandson is telling everybody that he's coming and uh, he goes in to tell his dad joseph rotman 
and uh, and Rotman asks if he warned Lamely, and he says, "Yeah, I told, I told everybody." And he said, "Well, you shouldn't have warned him because he wants Lamely to get in trouble because Lamely and Rotman are the two potential heirs to the the Workoff brothers' fortune. They're planning to take over the studio when uh, when Mister Workoff dies." He rolls into uh, his office. In a golden wheelchair. Yes, a golden automatic wheelchair. Um, and he just wants movie pitches. He doesn't want them to give him any bad news. He just wants ideas for f- features and good news about stuff that they've already put out. And this guy is followed like everywhere he goes by the two twins. twins. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. like very young, attractive twin girls that serve him. Yeah, he's a very a Hugh Hefner type character. Um, but in a wheelchair. So maybe a combination of Hugh Hefner and, and Larry, Larry Flint. Flint. Yeah. Um, he demands that they lock down a script to a book that he just read called The Happy Hooker by Xaviera Hollander. And uh, we see the tail end of a transaction between a cop and Xaviera. It turns out that the way she's been able to run her brothel in New York is basically a rotational basis bribe for the New York Police Department but by having sex with... <laughs> A, a different policeman each time yeah it's, it's like protection but it's right. like you're paying protection well, but without protection when he was leaving those <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> only sailors use costume condoms costumes, <laughs> costumes. <laughs> only sailors use condoms. sorry what were you gonna say uh i thought it was funny when he was leaving and and he thought he was never gonna make it back to the top <laughs> of the list before he had to retire yeah <laughs> probably never see you again name doesn't get to the top of the list again until sometime in 1993 so thanks uh Xaviera meets with Lori and Susie and uh she keeps a lawyer named George waiting uh Lori is working on a cross stitch of position 23 of the Kama Sutra her favorite she's been working on it for a long time apparently yeah, but I think she's supposed it, to be kind of dumb oh, well, but even when they show it it looks really terrible <laughs> yeah George the lawyer tells Zav that they want to adapt her book into a film and uh, he tells her that film rights, in his experience, could amount to an up to $3 million payday. And everyone's very excited about this in the office. Um, she says that she's going to go meet with them to talk about it. And a Variety headline spins into frame announcing that she's flying to Los Angeles like Variety would already care before <laughs> a meeting was even had between these two people. Uh, the grandson of the guy running the studio, Chuck Rotman, meets her at the airport. Xavier goes on the rita Beta show yeah this is supposed to be like some sort of like hollywood news right it's like a gossip show talk show type right but they're trying to like put her through the ringer with this yeah and the studio specifically set her up because they wanted to see how she could deal with the press and so she goes on the rita Beta show and rita just keeps trying to say oh what plastic surgery have you had and who did you have sex with since you got here have you slept with anyone interesting since coming to hollywood you mean Besides you. And then she's like, all right, interview's over. Anyway, this is the name of the book, and I think it's bad. Warkoff is not impressed by the interview, but everybody else seems to think, oh, well, at least she's fighting back. She she can defend herself in this in this uh, climate. <laughs> Warkoff, uh, disappointed with the interview, says, I think women should be felt and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> and the twins both immediately crack up at it because seems like they're paid to laugh at whatever he says xavier's driver tells her that she basically passed the studio's test so she tells him to pull over and they have sex in the limousine mr rotman at the studio tells her that when he looks at the wall in his office he sees movies and that's why he's a movie producer and she's a prostitute and so he starts to tell her what he imagines for this film and he's like making up a story of her childhood in sweden i look at the wall and I see you as a little child in your native Sweden. Holland. Whatever. It's like, my last name is literally Hollander. <laughs> like, how did you forget that? Um, but uh, he's just improvising the story. He clearly hasn't read the book. He just says, oh, you were taken advantage of by your teachers, and you developed, like, this this need for sexual contact. And she's like, "That's not none of that's in my book. Um, they sit her down and try to pitch her, like, the set design of the film instead of the story they're just showing her like oh this is what the windows are going to look like and these are the drapes and everything and uh lamely enters this is the adam west character his name is spelt lamely like the adverb but it's clearly a reference to carl lamely from universal 
and he says to her they're they're kind of ignoring the whole presentation that she's getting and he says to her that he wants to make her movie but he also wants to make love to her so they go to his home and have sex in his hot tub that night they throw a party at lamely's house and his friends mary and miles are the best screenwriters in town so he leaves them talking with Xaviera to try and sell her on them as screenwriters for the film which she agrees that they actually are yeah it seems like they've actually read the book Mm -hmm. which is more than we can say for for rotman earlier chris the actress who intends to play xavier in the film kind of pulls lamely aside and says hey you need to hurry up and sign this girl this movie needs to happen already because i need to be in it and he just tells her you know you got to wait you know these things take time and i have to do things right yeah there, there was a weird like Marion, the the female screenwriter, seems to be like fluctuating between disgust yeah. and and like, but infatuation. Yeah, or... I couldn't tell if she thought it was gross how this woman makes a living, or if she was like literally just hot for her. Yeah. Xaviera gives her approval for the writing team, and uh, Lamely and Xaviera sleep together again. But before that, Chris sets up a, a hidden camera. <laughs> yes, hidden. <laughs> yeah, hidden <laughs> camera. <laughs> camera is like the size of your head <laughs> yeah and it's just in the corner of the room with nothing in front of it just pointed right at the bed mm-hmm. um, it would be hard to not notice it if you were on this bed looking forward and so the two of them are having sex on camera which this doesn't pay off no, no. in any way nope because she immediately shows it to lamely the next morning yeah and she says i have footage of you two having sex and it's like yeah i'm a hollywood producer and she's a prostitute who's gonna <laughs> care who are you going to show this to? You can't blackmail me with this. I'm not married. Um, unless he is. I don't know. We never really cover that. Xaviera overhears them arguing about it and kind of realizes that she's being wined and dined and tricked by Lamely. And so at breakfast, she invites Chris to stay and eat with them and smashes a grapefruit in her face and then another one in Lamely's crotch. Before James walking Cagney the style. Yeah. Except for the crotch part. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I don't really know that reference. <laughs> <laughs> James Cagney smashed a grapefruit grapefruit in, a, in an actress's face on set for... No, it was, it was part of the movie. Okay, was, so he did... Was it part of the movie? Yeah, for Public Enemy. He didn't Enemy. use a crotch as a citrus juicer. No. Okay, good. All right. I yeah. thought it wasn't in the script. Was it not in the script? Well, it, it's a fam- it, the movie's Public Enemy. Yeah. Um, and he's a gangster, and this woman's kind of like mouthing off to him at the table, and so he just takes grapefruit and smashes it in her face. Yeah. That sounds uncomfortable. It's not great. I don't like grapefruits. It's a great movie, though. On her way out of the house, she passes Chuck Rotman, the son of... Uh, I thought his name was Robbie. He says Robbie at one point when a yeah. girl when he's auditioning an actress. He's, he's credited as Robbie, but you, you are right. He calls himself Chuck earlier in the film. Yes, he does. So I'll switch back and forth, too. <laughs> that um, won't be confusing at all. It's also confusing because I'm pretty sure that Robbie Rotten is the name of the bad guy on Lazy Town <laughs> that just passed away. Yeah. So Robbie Rotman is uncomfortably close to that. Wait. So I'm going to go with Chuck. Is Lazy Town the weird children's show? It's a show? piece of cake to bake a Yeah, that cake. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So that's not the version that I think of. <laughs> I shouldn't know the names of the characters on. <laughs> that, that is the version. I just didn't get into the. Okay. What's his name? Yeah. Little, Little John? John? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> she walks out the door and Chuck is standing there with a bunch of papers in his hand and Lamely's like trying to convince her to come back and he says, "What do you want, Chuck?" and he says, "Oh, nothing to do with you." And he turns around and starts following her and he gets in his car and she's just walking down the sidewalk like she's going to get anywhere on foot in Los Angeles. Well, she's also like just wearing a like a robe or a shirt that she picked up from there. Yeah, it's and very like, conservative for no, her. <laughs> no shoes. And she obviously doesn't have any of her stuff. It, right. She's it, just walking down the street. It, it's the walk of shame. Yeah. Um, and he offers her a ride and she just kind of ignores him and continues walking. And he pulls up next to her again. He's like, I don't know if you remember me from 10 feet back. I <laughs> still want to offer you a ride and I have some something I'd like you to see. And uh, she says, no, I'm going to go back to New York. And he says, on foot? It's going to take you a while. And they both laugh at this hysterical joke, and she gets in the car. And he hands her the script that he adapted from her book, seemingly overnight, a uh, treatment. But it's a lot of pages already. Yeah, yeah. Coming up is like the, the montage of them writing the script together. Right. We see them driving on PCH, and uh, she's already read the whole, the whole treatment, and she loves it. And so they go to, I guess, his house to write the script together. Um, and he's like getting tired as they're working on it. And he's like passing out on the couch at night. And then she says, I made some nudes. <laughs> some nudes. I made some nudes. 
some notes. <laughs> but I realized that she's saying I made some notes, but because yeah. of her accent, it definitely sounds like she's saying I made some nudes. I think we had to back that one up a couple times. Yeah, I was like, what did she say? Why did she draw naked pictures of herself on the script for him? They're talking about how she doesn't want to make the movie with the studio anymore, and so he says we can make it ourselves. We just need to find a way to raise the money, and we cut to LAX as the whole team from the New York brothel is rolling in with their suitcases. It's called the Stable of Horrors. There you go. The Stable of Horrors is here to raise the money. What is that like? Uh, like that was, a no. <laughs> Parliament of Owls? Or yeah. something? It was, it was, it was a reference. It was a reference from the other guys when Will Ferrell's recounting his story of how he helped friends, female friends in college, uh, make sure that they came to and from their dates. He's like, Same "You were a pimp. Thing. You were a pimp." It's like, "No, I wasn't a pimp." But you know, I had a whole bunch of girls working. Uh, you know, he was like, that, "That's called a stable of whores." <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, in Canada, they are ruled by a parliamentary of owls. It's an Sorry, interesting who? government. Canada. Who? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> One of them escaped. The girls are now running a studio called Pleasure Productions, which is a boutique whorehouse slash film studio. Uh, customer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they all are. <laughs> They're all film studios. <laughs> yeah. All the whorehouses are basically film studios. That's clearly what I meant. <laughs> I like how, I like how their skills just translate. Like they all just jump right in here and yeah. they're like, "We could run a production studio." Because mm-hmm. there's a switchboard at a whorehouse, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. The customer arrives looking for a uh, little Bo Peep, and is mistakenly sent to the jungle room. <sighs> I unabashedly skipped huge portions of this movie, so if I'm quiet, it's because of that. Because I was watching this in a very public place. <laughs> <laughs> And I was so like, I only <laughs> wanted to see when there were boobs on screen. Yeah, I was like, oh, got to get past this. Got to get past this. Gotta boring, past boring this. clothes. I like when she walks into, or when he walks into the jungle room, and you're like, this reminds me of uh, <laughs> what's her face's room from uh, To All a Good Night. Yeah, it's Leah's room, <laughs> or the girl from uh, The Changeling that had the ghost boy under her bed. Yeah, just excessive amounts of plants in the '80s, guys. Yeah, although it does kind of play into her fantasy theme for the room. Zaviera heads to their film processing lab and she says oh how much is it going to cost to shoot an entire movie and he what he should have said is I have no idea I need to know exactly how much footage you're going to bring me then we'll need to decide a bunch of other things along the way but instead he says here's your total ma'am you just pay in advance for <laughs> one all this film work. please yeah and she's like wow that's a lot of money how about we just have sex and he's like that's like forty eight thousand dollars on that piece of paper i just like you're not that good there's no way so well, we we're going to have sex 48 times i was yeah. gonna say we this might be a recurring transaction yeah no maybe it's a. we got a monthly withdrawal installments <laughs> a monthly <laughs> deposit <laughs> <laughs> one second one second beat me maybe in a little faster but yeah he luckily this guy takes sex instead of money Checks and, the box uh, on the form. Yeah. <laughs> there's, Will this there's be cash card or sex? <laughs> cash, grass, or ass. We get a montage of the Bo Peep, Cowgirl, BDSM, Birthday, Fantasy Rooms in Pleasure Studios. Xaviera tries to rent a house to shoot in for two days, and she ends up paying the realtor in Naked Women. <laughs> <laughs> How's he going to explain that to Ferris Bueller? Yeah, it's going to be awkward. <laughs> Should we explain that or no? No, no we're just going to keep not. moving on. A delivery man with food is roped into a fantasy scenario. He's like trying to bring food to a room. And when he knocks on the door, a bunch of disembodied arms just yank him in. Well, and uh, he gets he sucked re- into every room. Yeah, he repeatedly tries to deliver a sandwich to all of the ladies and nobody yeah. will take it. I would definitely come back the next day with another sandwich. <laughs> You'd be like, uh, dude, I'm trying to give this to this room now. Um, Joy Pecker arrives. And she wants to audition for Chuck, who introduces himself here as Robbie Rotman. She's performing a bit of Shakespeare while straddling him in a chair. And uh, they make out for a while. Yeah, who is this person? Just random She person? wanted to play Xaviera for the movie. Because they're not okay. going to go with Chris because they're not going with Warcoff Brothers anymore. Yeah, I guess. But I kind of figured at the point at which they're like, yeah, we're not going to make the movie with you anymore. They were just going to play themselves. Yeah, that would make sense. But that's not what happened. They're still auditioning actresses for some reason. We see them loading up equipment at the house that they're going to be shooting in when a guy pulls up and he says he's from one of the, the camera companies and they haven't been paid in a couple days, 
which in the real world you'd be like yes yeah, screw off we'll pay you in like six months Who yeah cares? We're, we're in net 75 here yeah. guys <laughs> it's gonna be a while go do your job uh, the guy's like i haven't been paid since monday and it's wednesday the girl is like the ditzy cross-stitching girl Lori, and she's like oh well i guess we can take care of it right now why don't you meet me in my trailer and so she goes to pay him with sex again and then uh the production manager woman comes out of the house and is like oh where did Lori go and they said oh she's about to pay the the camera company and she's like oh, the camera company's already been paid everything's covered and they're like well they just pulled up in that van and she's like we don't use acdc camera company and then it turns out these are cops they're here to pull a sting operation on the film because the Warcoff brothers called it in because they don't want this movie to get made without their money somehow everyone's able to post bail they don't really lose any time or money well, it was a thousand dollars a they person. definitely lost a bunch of money because they basically were out of budget now for the movie but it doesn't affect their ability to do the rest of the film for some reason because they're paying for everything in sex yep but they had to go and make a deal because they were out of money Oh, okay. I guess yeah, that's the difference there. So that was that was uh, Warkoff's prank on them was to get them all arrested, um, and then she decides that she's going to get a prank back on them, a revenge prank, and so she tells Rotman, the the father Rotman, Rotman Senior, and Lamely that she's ready to make a deal with Warkoff, and she tells each of them individually because they're both vying for Mister Warkoff's approval. She invites them both to the same hotel and she's flirting with them in adjacent hotel rooms as uh, as Lamely's in the elevator approaching the room. This weird bug-eyed Shriner guy is annoying him. He seems like he's drunk mm -hmm. and stuck in the elevator for some reason. Yeah. I've been riding all night, night on this elevator. Some guy said it was a party on 7. This damn thing only goes to sex. Xaviera tricks the two of them rotman and lamely into getting completely naked and joining her in a third hotel room between the two uh with the lights out and so they think that they're going to be having sex with her in this room in complete darkness uh but once they realize that she's actually snuck out of the room they also notice the doors are locked the phone cord is cut all their clothes are gone and there's just a few dresses in there yeah and there's also quite a bit of amorous sounds coming from the dark room yes before they realize that it's just two men. Right. But when the lights come on, it looks like Adam West is making out with a lamp. Mm. And uh, and Rotman is just kind of puckering up for a kiss. But unclear what has happened so far. <laughs> Which one of these two men is pregnant? They eventually, without any other options, decide to put on the dresses, attempt to escape the building. Yeah, and but drag. They, don't, they don't just put on the dresses. <laughs> yeah, that's they true. go all out. They are wearing the high heels. They are wearing like a feather boa. They have full makeup and mm -hmm. wigs. They have everything on. Like it right. wasn't even like they tried to make this. I think that was trying. I think that you don't blend in and sneak out of a building if you're just wearing a dress with dude hair and sneakers on. I don't know. I feel like you could have adjusted these outfits to just kind of casually look like a dude but they went full out women that's what i would have done in their situation i don't know where they found all the makeup though they must, she must have left makeup just yeah. in case they wanted to and like a little go tutorial. the extra mile because they did a good job like, yeah both of them were were passable women like i would have passed them literally <laughs> if they were coming down the hallway of my hotel i would have been like oh, two unattractive women I'm, I'm glad i'm glad that you wouldn't have gone for that <laughs> <laughs> but uh they, uh, as they're moving through the lobby, for some reason, the, the hotel management immediately recognizes them. <laughs> it's just like, oh, uh, Mr. Lamely and Mr. Rotman, what are you guys doing here? But they're also being followed out of the hotel by the, the bug-eyed Shriner guy. And he's asking, like, how much for the two of them for a night? And they get really frustrated with him. And Lamely winds up a punch. And the guy collapses before he can hit him, but he throws his punch into a cop's face. And of the two of them get arrested. <laughs> right. And then we get a variety headline announcing that the two of them have been, what, fired or something? Or or at least arrested. They, they're well, arrested yeah, and they, they don't get to work anymore? Yeah. They, I, I don't, are they even in the rest of the film? No, no they're not. No, yeah, they don't just, make this it. This is the gone. end of them for this whole movie. But also, like, she couldn't have planned 
any of that this. latter half like the extent for like i thought her plan was going to be they're in this room together they they turn on the lights and they're naked you know make it out with each other and she was gonna have like a camera in there and she was gonna like blackmail them into doing exactly what she wanted for this movie right but no her whole plan was to embarrass, embarrass them, them on them their like way that. out of the hotel i mean yeah. the arrested thing was just a a, was it coincidence? Oh, coincidence. Yeah. yeah, it was not planned at all. And it's they've also already done the I set up a camera to get you in trouble for having sex with someone you're not supposed to. So it's like why you can't use that joke twice in the movie anyway. It's just weird. They get a call from Warkoff and he wants to offer her a deal. But this is a trick deal. If she can deliver the film in time for the opening of his new theater, he will give her five million dollars. Otherwise, he will retain all the film rights and he can make the movie his own way. He makes this deal basically because he doesn't think she can finish the movie in time. So we get a quick montage of all the girls deciding $5 million is a lot. We don't have to sleep. We'll just get this thing done. And so they work crazy overtime to finish the film on schedule. They get a call from the lab saying, we'll deliver the film directly to the theater for you. But Xavier says, no, we'll pick it up ourselves because we don't want to risk anything going wrong. A group of Warkoff's henchmen break into the lab the day they're supposed to pick it up. Well, not only is this the day they're supposed to pick it up, it's they're like literally the time they're supposed to. Pick they're it up. literally driving it to the theater straight from the lab. Like I feel like I might have. I know it's a short time period to get this film done. I might have given myself at least a day yeah. for buffer before yeah. I had to drop the film off to be screened. But instead, they're picking it up right then. Uh, I, don't, I honestly don't think the film was even going to be ready until 6 and the screening is at 8. So they were even like risking a traffic problem preventing them from making this deadline. They go inside and as they're walking in, uh, Lori notices that people are walking out carrying cases that have Happy Hooker written on them. Chuck doesn't notice this. And as they walk into the lab, she's saying to Chuck, I didn't know that two movies could have the same name. And he's like, I don't, I don't think they can. She's like, well, those guys were carrying a movie with the same name as our movie. And they turn the corner and see everybody tied up and and with tape over their mouths. And he's like, oh, crap. that they're, They took our movie. We got to go. And they don't offer to untie any of these people. They just leave. <laughs> Which is the right choice. They yeah, yeah. yeah. Five million dollars on the line. They'll understand. So they hop back in the car and start chasing down these guys that have stolen the film. And we get a car chase all of a sudden. Technically two car chases, I guess. Because... The bad guy, they're chasing the bad guys, and then the bad guys are chasing them. Yeah, somehow the the car chase flips around, and they're being chased now because the screen art was just like, how do I get them to the theater if they're in a car chase? Why would the bad guys go to the theater where they're supposed to keep the film away? And they were like, well, what if suddenly in the confusion of a car chase where there's literally one objective for each driver <laughs> yeah. uh, they're accidentally chasing the people who were chasing them and they lead them the whole way to the theater so that's what happens and as they're driving we notice them they fly around a corner past the new beverly cinema in hollywood and somehow seconds later are skidding up onto the curb at the lorena theater on ventura boulevard in sherman oaks they crash into this stadium seating that's been set up for the premiere. Luckily, it's vacated because everybody's already moved into the theater. Lori and Chuck are able to grab the film out of the trunk of the crashed car and run it into the theater. Inside the theater, we see Mr. Workoff sitting in the front row as the trailer for The Apple is playing, which is another Golan Globus production we'll be covering later this year. Then the Happy Hooker film plays, as expected, on schedule, and he is freaking out about it for a second. And then he realizes, oh, the people really like this movie. I guess that's great for me. I guess this prank really turned out in my favor because I just bought the rights to this film and it's doing really well and I'll probably make my investment back. And then outside he gets interviewed by the press and he just says, yeah, I'm really excited. It's going to be a great movie and everything's going to be wonderful. And uh, they stop Xaviera and they say, hey, are, are we going to get a sequel out of this? And she says, well... I'd have to write another book. Maybe I'll maybe I'll make a movie about my experiences in Hollywood, and then she and Chuck wander off into the into the night, basically on foot, just down the street, down Ventura Boulevard, and that's the end of our film. So uh, the the way that we watched this movie is that it was on YouTube. Yes, as per usual, we check for closed captioning because 
you know, <laughs> we're old people. Yeah. And uh, can't hear anything. And also, we have three sleeping children in the and house. We have three so sleeping children. We have to have it yeah. so low that you can only hear the action and none of the dialogue. So, YouTube has this handy dandy feature where it automates subtitles when none exist. And boy, could I tell you, this made this movie so much more enjoyable than it would have been otherwise. I kept telling her to stop reading the subtitles. <laughs> and then I, I would just hear her crack up. up and then I would look at what it said. <laughs> Like, I think there was one time they said her name, and instead of saying oh, yeah. Xaviera, it just said Savvy Arab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was another time where he, he was like, oh. Uh, it was the guy looking for the boo peep thing, and he's like, oh, uh, my friend told me to, to come here, but he, he didn't tell me where to go or something like that. But it said, oh, my friend told me to come here, but he died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, no, poor guy. But yeah, so that that was that was going on in the background. It made this movie much more entertaining for Jess, I think. <laughs> this film was directed by Alan Roberts. Between directing Lady Chatterley's one and two, this was his first Happy Hooker film. None of the directors came back for another one. The writer here was Devin Goldenberg. This was, believe it or not, his only writing credit. Martine Beswick played Xaviera Hollander. She was Paula in Thunderball and Zora in From Russia with Love. Yeah. And I think For Marshall With Love was her first film. Uh, Zora is one of the um, Romani women who are fighting for one guy. And uh, Bond does a favor for the for the camp and they he gets to decide which one of the women gets to be with the guy by sleeping with them. Oh, okay. And he picked Zora? Uh, he picks them both. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he gets to sleep with both of them. Why not both? Very creative. Um, last year, Martine Beswick was in house of the gorgon with christopher neem oh so that's fun um they're both still working chris lemon was robbie rotman that's what he's credited as robbie rotman he played martin brew brewbaker in all three thunder in paradise films and the tv series i've never watched any of that no i don't know all of them star hulk hogan <laughs> it's like hulk Hogan's speedboat show slash movies uh adam west was lionel lamely uh you know him as mayor adam west mm-hmm or possibly Batman. He was also Principal Kent Schwinger on Pete and Pete. Yeah. <laughs> um, but most of his credits are, bat- are as Batman or Adam West. Yeah. He, in various other things. He he was a living caricature. Yeah. He, is, he was in on the joke, too, which yeah. is why he was so great. He wasn't in a lot of this movie. Like, he's, he's like, top billed, obviously, because he's a big name. But I was expecting a lot more story from him. I have a feeling, and I haven't seen the movie, but we watched the trailer, that um, uh, is it Guy Hamilton is in uh, the, the second film, the Happy Hooker Goes to yeah, Washington. Yeah, And I think that uh, he probably, that's the guy's name, right? The the tan guy that played Zorro? No, uh, Guy Hamilton. George Hamilton. George, George Hamilton. Hamilton. There Sorry. you go. I was like, that, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, that's why it was bugging me. I think Guy Hamilton is a director. Um I think he directed Remo Williams and a couple James Bond movies, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, George Hamilton probably plays a very similar character. He's like the straight man who's exasperated by all of her silliness in the the second installment, The Happy Hooker Goes to Washington. But I don't feel like Lamely was exasperated by her at all. No, but he was like falling victim to her silliness. Silliness? You mean sexiness by the time that she tricked two guys into raping each other um richard deacon was joseph rotman Mm. um he plays earl lyon in piranha he's mel cooley on the dick van dyke show probably is that's the that's the number one yeah the thing that i know most known for um he played six characters on mr ed five of them were doctors all with different last names and he was also in the richard donner twilight zone episode about a ceo who automates an entire factory um, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one, but no. Phil Silvers was William B. Warkoff. Yay. And uh, he's Sergeant Bilko from the Phil Silvers show. He looks a lot to me like Merkin Muffley from Dr. Strangelove, the <laughs> Peter Sellers president character. And uh, of the three characters he plays in that movie, he was also in Mad, 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 Mad World. Charles Green was George. I forget who George was. The lawyer. The lawyer. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, Xavier's lawyer. Um, he plays a bartender in Jumanji 3, the one that just came out, the next level. 
He's also. <laughs> I like that you refer to it as Jumanji Three. That's what it is, right? <laughs> Just well, like the next the... Ghostbusters movie is Ghostbusters Four, regardless of what it, anyone else wants to call it. But well, if you're a sequel to a reboot, I don't think you could be called. Well, but they, it wasn't a reboot. It wasn't a reboot. They they did establish that the first Jumanji did exist. The game board from oh, the first movie okay. is in the second Jumanji. I guess movie. it's not a reboot. It yeah. just didn't have a number in the title. And they they found a treehouse that said uh, Alan Parrish had All his right. name on there. All right, fair enough. Um, he also plays a preacher in the the HBO Watchmen series that just ended. He plays a U.S. senator in Doctor Sleep, so he's still working pretty regularly. Susan Kiger played Susie. She'll be the blue girl in our next episode. <laughs> <laughs> galaxina <laughs> jack perkins was the drunk conventioner i think this is the the shriner character and then he'll be back later this year and herbie goes bananas he also has an uncredited role as desperado in blazing saddles dick miller was the cop yeah the cop that was <laughs> receiving the bribe at the beginning of the film that's my biggest problem with this movie it doesn't have enough dick <laughs> miller that's true well so you know this guy gets on screen and i i wouldn't be able to you know pull his name out of thin air but i obviously recognize him he was he was famous at the time of this movie right he's always well, been famous yeah. i know but i'm just like he, he was seems, born famous he's too recognizable to me for this movie yeah, he, he's pretty he's in every joe pretty dante much every movie. joe dante movie like yeah. all of them um yeah he was gremlins burbs explorers howling i think all of them or possibly mm. all of them yeah it, it's him and robert picardo that that make as many appearances as possible yeah picardo actually has two characters in explorers right uh because he's at the drive-in and he's the and he's the voice of alien voice yeah dick miller was also in 30 episodes of the fame tv series as lou Mackey. i didn't watch any of that he was in that walter pilot the the radar (laughs) o'reilly spinoff that didn't even get Mm. picked up he was also the pawn shop clerk in terminator and he was obviously in joe dante's twilight zone segment this was weird though the character in the twilight zone segment is named walter paisley and he also plays walter paisley in chopping mall oh so i don't know if it's supposed to be the same guy or I'm, they just but chopping a mall reference. came after so yeah but it's, it's they probably are referencing his other but character. chopping mall is like a schlock horror but, thing but chopping mall came came before yeah the twilight but like zone it's episode. like the, did it well the twilight zone movie yeah they're both around like 84-ish, right? Oh, really? When was Chopping Mall? I thought Chopping Mall was after Twilight Zone. Yeah, you're right. 84? It was, it, it was 83, but yeah, you're right. It came, okay. it came after. I mean, it could be like a changeling situation. Where they just, they're referencing his previous character from yeah. the movie just to be fun. But either way, I thought that was interesting. And now when I watch those next two things, I'm going to try and see if it's possible that he's the same character in both of them. He'll also be back later this year in Used Cars. We had Kim Hopkins playing young Xaviera in the flashback that Mr. Rotman is projecting on the wall in his office. The fictional childhood version of her. This is one of the pom-pom girls from Hollywood Nights. One of the ones that remembered to wear underwear. Aaron Apale played Raul. I'm not sure who Raul was in this. I'm going to assume it's the delivery guy. Oh, okay. Um, he plays the Pharaoh Seti in uh, The Mummy 1 and 2. Ian Abercrombie was Dennis. And uh, he plays the wise man in Army of Darkness. He was Alfred on a Bird of Prey, Birds of Prey TV series in like the early 2000s. He's the a voice great of, cast. That yeah, Birds of Prey series. It was Mia Sarah as Harley Quinn. Uh I, I pulled it up earlier it was it was interesting that was like her and him were the only two names that i feel like i'd, I'd known before oh although aaron paul i think was in there too i don't remember who he was so yeah ashley scott dina meyer ina mccrami mia sarah I don't know and mia sarah is playing like i forget the character's name but it's clearly harley quinn she's yeah she's like playing harley quinn dr harriet quinley or something he's also the voice of palpatine on the clone wars ian abercrombie and he plays a psychiatrist in Jack Frost 2. <laughs> That's the killer snowman Jack yeah, Frost, Frost 2. 2. I, I think it's funny, though, that he plays Palpatine when another Ian played Palpatine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and he also plays a character named Jaime in the Ice Pirates, the Stuart Raffle film. Okay. That we haven't gotten to yet. I hope that's in the future. I believe it's in the future. And uh, Lyman Ward was the real estate agent. 
Uh, we're not going to say what he was in. No. Uh, <laughs> he played Mr. Bueller in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, hence the joke Richard made earlier. Rewind it. It was okay. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't that great. He also, you don't need to rewind. Uh, no, back it up. It's really worth it. Listen to this whole episode again. <laughs> Mr. Grady in Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And then we had Army Archer playing himself. He's himself in a lot of stuff. He's in the first few Planet of the Apes movies. If you took out all the sex scenes, I think this movie would only be an hour long. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. I think it would have been interesting if they'd cast actors to play any of the characters. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because it felt like this was actually her playing herself and all of her actual Mm -hmm. stable of whores playing themselves. (laughs) Because none of these, none of the people in the whole pleasure studios building seem to have any acting chops yeah it was mildly musing on a couple of occasions and that's about as a good a review as i can give it although i will admit that it does look better than happy hooker goes to washington did from the trailer which is at least it has like inside baseball like movie making jokes and stuff like that whereas the politics version of the story is considerably less entertaining i would guess well that's because you're you're inside hollywood and you're not inside politics maybe you'd like that exactly. one better if you were a senator well if you i was like a senator, i could relate to uh whores uh coming to me yeah. for uh, i would have liked this movie favors. more if i was a senator <laughs> i'd have been like oh man that's just like the whores i use jess up or down uh so i'm gonna give this a down yeah, I'm going to do that also. Yeah, down for me too. Unless you're an Adam West completist, in which case <laughs> also he completes. In, in which case I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Letterbox. Uh, it's going to be pretty low on my list, I think. Um, I'm going to put this um Hmm. I'm going to put this below nothing personal but above don't answer the phone below nothing personal that's a a sign of a good film i'm gonna put this one uh, below private eyes and above effects okay which is pretty darn close to the bottom i'm gonna put this below gorp but above nothing personal that's where that goes for me but I think that's everything we have for this one. Uh, if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Galaxina, which IMDb describes like so. Just when they think they're about to get some much-needed rest and relaxation, the crew of the police cruiser Infinity is given a new mission. Journey to the alien world Altar 1. Is it Altar or Altar? Al- Altair. Altair. To find the Blue Star. The Blue Star. We leave you now with the trailer for Galaxina. Once upon a time, that hasn't happened yet. There will be a spaceship called the Infinity. And steering the Infinity among the heavenly bodies will be the most heavenly body of them all, called Galaxina, a dream machine, transistorized and computerized to lead her space buddies across the farthest reaches of fantastic adventure with class. The Nugian Thunder Ripple. 2001, a great year. Great. Galaxina, the beautiful. Galaxina, the untouchable. (laughs) Galaxina, the invincible. She cleans. She cooks. She does windows and more. I've adjusted my temperature. I'm better than a human woman. What year is it? 3,035. I got 3,033. This thing's slow. It's party time on the planets with the beautiful people of the intergalactic jet set. (laughs) 
Well, at least you're not two-faced. So you wouldn't have chosen the one you've got on. Tension to the fourth dimension as they dodge death rays across the universe. Good guys, bad guys, nice aliens. Mommy! Look at it. Huh? <laughs> It'll be my day <laughs> Nasty aliens. The name's Mr. Spot. Galaxina, starring Stephen Mock, Avery Schreiber, James David Hinton, and introducing Dorothy R. Stratton, Playboy's Playmate of the Year as your favorite gal, Galaxina. Yeah.